The local access rate um, or line speed is the maximum speed that a line can physically support. And kind of going along with that is the committed information rate or the CIR. So the, the local access rate is what the, the line can physically support, you know, just the physics of that technology, the number of bits that you can possibly send, uh, local, local access rate. The CIR is the minimum speed the ISP guarantees for your line, and it's usually, um, you know, a, a paid rate. So two things heavily affect the cost of frame relay. One is the number of PVCs and the CIR of each PVC. So, um, you know, like on this one, for instance, Arizona, has three PVCs to these routers over here. The actual local access rate, the, the line speed is up to 1.544 megabits per second. On each of the PVCs, it's got a committed information rate, you know, 500K here, 450, 300. And you can see that all of those added together do not exceed 1.544 megabits per second. If you were ever to be in a situation where you have multiple PVCs that their CIRs add up to more than your, your possible line speed, you're getting ripped off. You need to talk to your service provider and figure out like what's going on here because you're basically being charged for a CIR that there's no way the ISP can possibly deliver because the line speed will not will not accept it. Um, backwards explicit congestion notification or beckon. This is kind of a, an interesting topic. Um, so. Backwards explicit uh, congestion notification is a bit inside of a, a frame that is flipped on return traffic if the line is being overutilized. Um, when the ISP sees the line getting overutilized by a sender, it will have the beckon bit turned on and TCP ACK packet sent back to the sender from the receiver to tell the sender to slow down the traffic. So whenever you've got a, a TCP connection, you have to go through a process. It's a it's connection oriented, so you have to go through a process of sending a, a SYN, an ACK, and a SYN ACK packet back and forth between the sender and the receiver to establish that TCP session. Um, so what happens is if you're overutilizing the line, you send your SYN packet, the sender sends its SYN packet to the receiver, the, the receiver tries to send its ACK packet back, the ISP is going to mark that ACK packet uh, mark the bit in it to let you know that um, you're over utilizing the line. The, the original sender s uh, receives that packet, they see that that bit is set up, and uh, they realize that, hey, I'm, I must be sending more data than this line can support, I need to slow down. Um, so that's that's basically how a, a, beckon, a beckon works. Now, a feckon, the, the best term in networking ever, uh, forward explicit congestion notification whenever so this one's a little bit weird you would think that um, it would be like the the opposite of a beckon where it's it's sending the bit first but it, that doesn't make sense because how would a sender know before it sent anything that it's sending too much data it would have to have some some input from the other side what a feckon actually does is so we talked about how a beckon works with with TCP well what if you're sending UDP traffic UDP does not have the the syn ACK uh, syn -ac, um, relationship where you have to um, establish a connection with a with a receiver with UDP you're just sending the traffic you don't care it's not as important you don't care if it gets there hopefully it'll get there most of the time it'll get there but you're not real worried about it but because of that there's not a there's no element in there to kind of receive some feedback from the receiver to let you know what's going on well what a feckin is is the, uh, the ISP sends a forward explicit congestion notification packet to the receiver. When the receiver sees the feckin, it generates a, a junk frame, a uh, Q.922 test back to the sending end so that the ISP can turn on the beckon bit on the junk frame. So, you know, basically the, the ISP sees that the line is, is overused. Um, it, uh, it sends the feckin packet to the, the receiver who's receiving the excess traffic. That feckin packet causes the receiver to um, generate this junk Q92, Q.922 frame so that the, uh, the ISP can turn on a beckon bit. So that'll finally make it back to the original sender. Sender sees that the beckon bit is turned on and realizes, hey, I'm overutilizing this line. I need to slow down my traffic pattern. Um, so that's, that's basically how a, a beckon and a feckin work. Um, it's important to kind of understand like the difference between those and you might want to try to focus on the reading on that if you didn't get what I was um, trying to get across there because a lot of people kind of get get hung up on the difference between a beckon and a feckin and what they even actually do. 
Um, so discard eligible. Um, any traffic sent above the committed information rate, or CIR, will be marked as discard eligible by the service provider. It doesn't necessarily mean the frame is going to be discarded. In fact, most of the time it's probably going to get there anyway if it's if it's labeled as discard eligible. But it can be discarded if the ISP sees that their network is congested. So, if you send, say, you've got a, a you know a rate of 500k, uh, your your committed information rate is 500 kilobits per second, and you're sending five 550k, it's going to mark 50 kilobits uh, of those packets with as discard eligible. And then if the, the, the ISP sees that, hey, my larger network is getting congested, I cannot send all this traffic, it's going to look at there and, and just randomly drop packets that have discard eligible so that it can uh, stay within its bandwidth constraints and not be overutilized. So there's, a, there's kind of a negative to that in that your, your ISP is just randomly uh, marking your traffic discard eligible. You don't really know for sure like what traffic it's marking el uh, discard eligible. Like if it starts uh, marking VoIP traffic as discard eligible rather than just like web traffic, it's going to more than likely discard some traffic that you really need to get through when you might be sending stuff that you don't really worry about. So when you get in later to like the CCMP and beyond, you can find that you can even tag your own packets as discard eligible in order to control which packets would be discarded instead of just leaving that up to the service provider. So. Rather than um, just letting you know letting that go to fade, you can you know identify which of your traffic patterns are less important and mark those discard eligible uh, to avoid something like you know streaming video or voice from getting dropped when that'll really cause a detrimental network effects. Uh, so non-broadcast multi-access networks or NBMA networks can experience problems with routing updates due to the split horizon rules. Um, these can be overcome with uh, a couple of options including sub interfaces but if you remember the stuff from like rip and uh, you know routing updates and stuff uh, we talked about you know routing loops and how those are created and what rip uses to try to avoid those routing loops and one of those um, options is the split horizon option where basically if a if a router receives a routing update on an interface it will send that it'll reforward that uh, routing update but it won't uh, send it back out the interface that it received it on so in other words you don't want two router you, you basically just don't want it sending back the routing information to the router it learned it on or it's going to create a routing loop very likely um, so but with frame relay <coughs> since you've got these PVCs here you may you may still need that um, routing update to go out uh, the interface it was received on because since these are on the same physical interface you still need that um, that routing update to go out the other logical interface. Well, if you're if you're not using sub interfaces, Split Horizon is going to say, well, no, I, I just received this on that physical interface. I can't I can't reforward that. It's going to create a routing loop. So, if you create sub interfaces, and we'll talk about this a little in a little bit more detail, but if you create sub interfaces, it um, it basically makes the router see the interfaces as two completely different interfaces, even though they technically are on the same physical interface. And it's able to, um, you know, still send out that routing update on the the logical interface. Um, so sub interfaces, multi point sub interfaces, do not solve the split horizon problem. Um, although they are useful for for some other non frame relay connections, they should be avoided in frame relay networks in general. Point to point sub interfaces create a separate logical interface for each PVC on a physical interface. The router then views each of these sub interfaces as separate interfaces, even though they share the same physical interface, thus avoiding a split horizon problem with frame relay. Pretty much what I just said. Um, so, address mapping, um, and this kind of even a little bit touches on that, but uh, frame relay needs a way of mapping IPs to DELCs in order for layer three to function correctly. This can be done two ways. So. You know, you've got your DELCs built on there. You need to know like what IP that's actually going to be going to on the other side. So one way that you can do that is inverse ARP, which is basically sends a reverse ARP message down each DELC requesting the IP at the other end. It then uh, you know receives that information and maps each of these to the routing table automatically. This does not work with sub interfaces, so the split horizon problem recurs. Um, static mappings is the other option, and to me the preferred option. Um, static mappings is exactly what it sounds like. You statically configure mappings of uh, each DELC to the destination IP on the other 